Hi everybody! So today we're going to take a look at a quartz sphere and investigate some of the fun experiments we can do with the quartz sphere using a polariscope. If you'd like to buy your own quartz sphere and follow along with these experiments, you can do so by going to the eBay store, Snellius Minerals. And make sure to check out some of the other nerdy mineral samples while you're there. So here we have some examples of our quartz spheres. These are made from clear, natural quartz crystals. Uh, this is also known as rock crystal. Because these are natural crystals, they often have inclusions of various sorts. And in these spheres, you can see the inclusions as sort of uh, feathery white areas of material in the sphere. The quartz spheres range in diameter from a little over a centimeter to about a centimeter and a half. And unlike many of our other products, I do not actually make these. Uh, these I purchased at the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show. So you certainly may be able to find these quartz spheres from other vendors. I'd appreciate if you purchased these from me. It'll help support the nerdy mineral videos. And I do make sure these experiments work for each individual quartz sphere before I send them out. Some of the quartz spheres I've gotten are just a bit too included to be useful or they have twinning in such a way that it's going to make things a bit more complicated than we might want to start out with. We've already talked a bunch about the optical properties of quartz in our video Snellius Minerals Quartz Slice, but let's quickly go over some information about quartz again before getting into the demonstration with our quartz sphere. And if you've seen my other videos, you've probably heard my spiel on what the big picture is going on here, but it's certainly worth repeating. We have a mineral, and that mineral is defined by its chemistry and structure. That chemistry and structure in turn lead to the crystallography we'll see at the macro scale, as well as the optical properties we can observe, or any other sort of physical property. By combining our optical properties and our crystallography, we can often identify materials. Or if we know the identity of a material and we combine that with our optical properties, we can determine how that material is oriented in space. Or if we know the identity of a material and can combine that with some observable crystallographic forms, we can predict how the optical properties will behave in a particular direction through our crystal, or also any other physical property. So our quartz is defined by its chemistry and structure. In the case of quartz, the chemistry is SiO2. And the structure consists of helical chains of silica tetrahedra. Check out a website like Mindat for much better structure models of quartz than I could ever make. The chemistry and structure of our quartz results in the space group and point group symmetries of our quartz. We think about the space group symmetry of quartz when looking at the micro scale, and the point group symmetry of quartz when we're looking at macro scale. So we have two different space group symmetries for our quartz because these are actually dependent upon which direction those helical chains of silica tetrahedra spiral. So those space groups are P3221 or P3121. Our point group symmetry for quartz is 32, and here's an example of a quartz crystal oriented by that point group symmetry. The chemistry and structure of our quartz also give rise to our optical properties. In this case, quartz is uniaxial positive, with refractive index epsilon being 1.553 and refractive index omega being 1.544. Here's an example of pleochroism in a slice of citrine looking at pleochroic end member colors associated with refractive index omega and refractive index epsilon. So when thinking about the optical properties of quartz, we want to talk about the optical indicatrix. This is a three-dimensional representation of the refractive indices of our quartz. As our quartz is uniaxial, refractive index epsilon is aligned with our C crystallographic axis, and refractive index omega is aligned with the plane of the A axes. And the two views of our optical indicatrix here are the most important for gathering information on a uniaxial substance. For more in-depth information on this, go check out Optical Mineralogy Uniaxial Minerals. Now that we've gone through a bunch of theory, let's take a look at our quartz sphere using our polariscope. So we're starting off with a view in plane polarized light, and that plane polarized light is vibrating in a north-south direction. 
So with our close-up on the quartz sphere, you can see some of the inclusions that we talked about before. And with this video, that's actually going to be kind of helpful. It's going to help you actually be able to follow the rotations as we move the quartz sphere in space. So with our plain polarized light, we'd have the possibility of seeing pleochroism with our quartz sphere. So let's just rotate the quartz sphere around a bit and see if we notice anything. We don't actually end up seeing anything, however, because the quartz sphere is clear, and so there's no possibility of differential absorption of light. Well, that was kind of boring, but that's okay. Let's bring in our upper polarizer and take a look at our sample with crossed polarizers. So as the upper polarizer comes into our field of view, you can see that the quartz sphere is currently transmitting light. We'll rotate it around a bit and see if we notice anything fun. And with enough reorienting of our quartz sphere, we can eventually get it to the point where we see a nice quartz uniaxial optic axis interference figure. So this is similar to our other uniaxial optic axis interference figures. However, with quartz, we have the special bonus property going on of optical activity. And so we end up with this pink circle sort of erasing the center of our uniaxial optic axis interference figure. So for a comparison, here's actually the quartz sphere uniaxial optic axis interference figure compared with the corundum sphere uniaxial optic axis interference figure. If you want to learn more about the optical activity of quartz caused by those helical chains of silica tetrahedra spiraling parallel to the C crystallographic axis, check out the Snellius Minerals Quartz Slice video. Also, we should point out that it's a little strange that we're viewing a uniaxial optic axis interference figure in this moment because we haven't set up our polariscope to generate a uniaxial optic axis interference figure. Right now we're at crossed polarizers and we haven't brought in a converging lens which is usually necessary for us to generate the optic axis interference figure. And the reason why is because the quartz sphere itself is acting as a converging lens. No need to bring an additional lens in. So now is a good time to talk about the complications that arise from our light traveling through our quartz sphere. The spherical geometry makes things a bit more complex. Uh, we did a deep dive into this in the video Snellius Minerals Corundum Sphere. But let's do a speed round of why cubes are better than spheres. So we're going to start off with an example examining Snell's law and how light ends up interacting with a cube of a mineral like spinel, which is isotropic. So as our light ray traveling through air hits the interface between air and spinel, it's going to be refracted according to Snell's law. The math to understand this is pretty simple too. And if we think about this for multiple geometries, there's one that stands out for simplicity. That is, this scenario, in which our light is traveling perpendicular to the face of our cube. In this scenario, there's no reorientation of the light ray, and so we don't have to think too hard about Snell's law and how our light ray is actually going to end up traveling through our cube. This simplicity is part of the inspiration for Snellius Minerals. And the beauty to this simplicity becomes even more apparent as soon as we start thinking about multiple light rays interacting with this geometry. This simplicity is why I like cubes and slices of material that have two parallel faces perpendicular to the direction of travel of our light. They're just simpler to deal with and better highlight the anisotropy that our minerals can display. Now let's take a look at how light will end up interacting with a sphere of spinel. So there is one direction through our sphere of spinel where our light is going to end up behaving very simply. However, as soon as we bring on an additional ray, we start to have to think about Snell's law. And then after our initial reorientation of light, we have to think about Snell's law again as our light ray tries to exit the sphere. And here we have a bonus complication of if angle A happens to be greater than the critical angle for our spinel air system, then the light ray is actually going to be totally internally reflected. These are just the complications that arise from trying to track light around an isotropic substance like spinel. Our anisotropic quartz sphere is actually going to be even more complicated. 
so complicated in fact that I'm not going to try and trace light rays around the interior of it and instead just say, our complications are going to be minimized by focusing on light rays traveling through the center of the sphere. So the take home message is light interacting with our cube geometry is much simpler to understand than light interacting with the spherical geometry. That being said, the fact that the quartz sphere generates its own uniaxial optic axis interference figure is pretty cool, and it tells us everything we need to know about what direction we must be looking through our quartz in this moment. We're looking along the optic axis and the C crystallographic axis. So for the quartz sphere, I find this is the quickest way to determine the orientation of our quartz in space. But just a quick important side note, we can't actually determine the location of the individual A axes using our optical properties. We can only determine the location of the plane of the A axes. And now that we have our quartz sphere oriented in space, let's try and take a view looking down the plane of the A axes. So let's return to plane polarized light. And now I'm going to attempt to flip the quartz sphere 90 degrees so that we're looking down the plane of the A axis. And if I've done this appropriately, we are now looking down the plane of the A axis and at this view of our optical indicatrix for quartz. We've already determined earlier that our quartz sphere does not display any pleochroism. And that's because our quartz sphere is clear. If we had a citrine sphere or a smoky quartz sphere, we would actually be able to see some pleochroism in this direction, and this direction would illustrate the maximum difference between our pleochroic and member colors associated with refractive index epsilon and refractive index omega. Our clear quartz sphere isn't going to do any of that though, so there's not really any point in rotating it in plain polarized light. Let's get right to crossed polarizers. And what should happen as we bring in our upper polarizer is our sphere should be at extinction as our plain polarized light is aligned with refractive index epsilon. So as we bring in our upper polarizer, you can see that is indeed the case as our sphere is at extinction. And as we begin to rotate the sphere with crossed polarizers, you'll notice it begins to transmit light when we're no longer aligned with refractive index epsilon. So earlier, the spherical geometry of our quartz sample caused us to generate a uniaxial optic axis interference figure when viewing the quartz with cross polarizers and looking down the C crystallographic axis. So what we're seeing here is actually a flash interference figure as we rotate our quartz sphere while looking down the plane of the A axis. When our plane polarized light is aligned with refractive index epsilon, the sphere is dark, but as soon as we begin to rotate away from that position, diffuse isogyres leave our field of view. So let's rewatch this segment of video now and try and notice the pattern our isogyres form as I rotate the quartz sphere. Did you spot that they enter and exit the quartz sphere on opposite sides? That's a pretty good flash interference figure, and so we are indeed looking down the plane of the A axis, or at least somewhere pretty close to it. So we've taken a look now at the most important views of our quartz sphere, where we're looking down the C crystallographic axis and looking down the plane of the A axis. But one of the benefits of the quartz sphere is that we can actually take a whole bunch of different views looking through our sample. So let's reset everything here back to plain polarized light. And what we're going to do now is we'll bring in our upper polarizer and view our sample in a variety of different orientations. And you can get a sense of the different sorts of views we'll have if we're not exactly looking down the plane of the A axis or looking down the C crystallographic axis. So what we're seeing here is an off-centered uniaxial optic axis interference figure. But it's hard to keep the sphere rotating in the same plane, so we're, we're wandering around a bit, too. We've made it through all the fun experiments I wanted to show you with the quartz sphere. So now let's just take a moment and compare and contrast our other product, the quartz slice, with the quartz sphere. 
So the quartz slice has a simple geometry for its interaction with light, and it also only has two fixed views. You're either going to be looking down the C crystallographic axis if you have it laying flat on your polariscope, or the plane of the A axes. This makes the quartz slice ideal for when you're just starting out trying to understand the optical properties of materials. We've also got these in multiple different varieties. In contrast, the quartz sphere has a complex geometry for its interactions with light. But the benefit of the quartz sphere is that there are many different views you can take through the quartz crystal, and so you're not confined to looking down the C crystallographic axis or the plane of the A axes, but in order to understand what's going on with the quartz sphere, you probably want to have a good handle on optical properties before you try this out. Also, with the quartz sphere, we only have one variety with the clear quartz. Someday this may change if I find others for sale. Unfortunately, I don't have the capabilities to make spheres myself, at least not as yet. Maybe someday in the future. So I hope you consider purchasing a quartz sphere and trying out some of the experiments that we showed today for yourself. These are for sale, along with a variety of other minerals at the eBay store, Snellius Minerals. Check out some of the other products while you're there. There are a variety of very nerdy things. If you have any questions, comments, or special requests, feel free to reach out to us via email at SnelliusMinerals at gmail.com. Here are the references I consulted in putting this video together. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video informative. And have a great day.